أعوذ بالله من الشيطان اللعين الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم السلام عليكم brothers and sisters ورحمة الله وبركاته <clears throat> I'd like to welcome you all to our next series of talks on the tafsir of Surah Al-Hujurat With the help of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and with His grace we completed the tafsir of Surah Al-Tawbah and inshallah, for the next several sessions, uh, we'll be spending some time reflecting on the verses of Surat Al Hujurat. Now, Surat Al Hujurat is the 49th chapter of the Holy Quran. And when I say 49th, I mean in, the, in its sequential order. So, Surat Al Fatiha is the first, Surat Al Baqarah. So in its sequential order in the Qur'an that we have with us today, it's the 49th chapter of the Holy Qur'an. And it is a relatively short surah in that it only contains 18 verses. Now, chronologically, Surat Al-Hujurat is a late Madani surah. So this was a surah that was revealed according to many according to most commentators of the holy quran it was a surah that was revealed in the ninth year after the hijrah known as amul wufud the year of delegation so this is after the conquest of mecca the prophet is now essentially ruling over the arabian peninsula and this is a surah that is revealed towards the end of the prophet's life it's about the same time frame as the revelation of Surat at tawbah which we covered. Now, the, the word Hujurat, the name of the Surah is Surat Al-Hujurat. Now, the word Hujurat is the plural. It's the plural form of the word Hujurat. Hujra is the singular, Hujrat is the plural. Now, Hujra in the Arabic language refers to the rooms in a house. So, for example, the, the individual rooms in a house are called the Hujras. Now, the Prophet ﷺ in Medina, his home was adjacent to the masjid it was actually attached to the masjid and when he would open the door from his house it would open into his masjid and because the holy prophet sallallahu had multiple wives each wife had her own private chamber her own private small little apartment so the surah actually derives its name from the reference to the private apartments of the Prophet's wives, and it's mentioned in verse number four. So the name of the surah derives itself from the fourth ayah where Allah says, In the Ladina Yunaduna Kimin Wara al Hujurat, that those who call upon you from behind, from outside of your private apartments, Aktharuhum La Yaqilun. Now, why is this? Surah significant. Now, Surah Al Hujurat. It's a surah that, again, as I mentioned, it's it's revealed at the end of the Prophet's life in the ninth year after the Hijrah, and it's a surah that addresses the complexities of ruling over the larger and more diverse community, and it instructs more recent converts because as you know after the conquest of mecca there is a huge influx of new converts there's an influx of people coming into the fold of islam as allah says Ida jaa wal -fatih, wa nas fi afwaja. that after the conquest of mecca Entire tribes made up of thousands of people were entering Islam. So you see that within a very short period of time, the population of the Muslim community rapidly grows. 
And therefore you find all of these new people joining the faith. And there are people from different parts of the Arabian Peninsula, different tribes, different dialects, people of different backgrounds. Some of them used to be Christian, others used to be Jews, some used to be polytheists, people from different uh, ethnicities. So now the Prophet you know, especially in the eighth year, the ninth year, the tenth year after the Hijrah, the Muslim community has become very diverse. It's become very large. So this surah essentially teaches the Muslim community how to treat each other. So, you know, if you look at the surah, commentators often refer to this surah as surah al-akhlaq wal adab. Surah Al-Hujurat is also known as the chapter of ethics, the chapter of mannerism. Because the most important thing in the Muslim community is that is how you treat each other. You know, what's the point in having a large number of followers? What's the point? There is there's no there there's no point in having a large population if the hearts are not united. So you see that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala through the surah reminds the Muslim community, the growing Muslim community, that your strength is not necessarily in your numbers. You might be, you know, you might be a community of hundreds and thousands of hundreds of thousands of people, but you will be the weakest community if your hearts are not united, if you don't treat each other like brothers and sisters. And therefore you find that this surah deals with a number of different relationships. So for example, when you look at this surah, if you look at the, you know, the, the outline of the, of the chapter, the anatomy of, of surah al-hujurat, you can divide it up into three main sections. So we said that there are 18 verses, and you can basically divide these 18 verses into three parts, three main themes. The first part of the surah, verses 1 through 5, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala instructs the Muslim community in the proper etiquette for their encounters with the Prophet. So you see that, you know, especially because there are so many new new people coming into Islam, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has to teach these new converts how they are to interact with the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi. That Rasulullah is not just a tribal leader, that there is a certain etiquette that has to be observed in your interactions with the Holy Prophet. So verses 1 through 5 speaks about how to interact with the Prophet, how to deal with him how are you supposed to behave when you encounter the prophet when you speak to him when you're in his presence so the first part of the surah deals with our relationship with the prophet the second part of the surah the second section verses 6 through 12 focuses upon the ties of brotherhood within the muslim community and the forms of behavior that should be avoided to facilitate the spirit of brotherhood. So the first part of the surah, how to deal with the Prophet, how to treat the Prophet. The second part of the surah, verses 6 through 12, how to treat each other. How, how are Muslims supposed to treat one another? What types of behaviors are encouraged? What are the types of behaviors that we should avoid? How are we going to create a true community of brotherhood and sisterhood? And then the third section of the surah, verses 13 through 18, the, the surah clarifies the true nature of faith and belief. Now, so you have all of these newcomers to Islam they recite the shahada, they say, La ilaha illallah, Muhammadun Rasulullah, and they, they're, they're officially Muslims now. But is that it? And some of them may have started praying and fasting, 
But is Islam, is that all this religion is, is teaching? Or is faith something a lot more deeper than that? So Allah, at the end of the surah, He speaks about the true nature of faith and belief. That this, this deen is not just a deen of, of ritual. That it's not, you're not a believer if you just pray and you fast and you go to Hajj and you recite the Quran. This religion is all about how you treat yourself, how, how you honor your relationship with God, and how you interact with the people around you. This is, this is the nature of faith. How you treat the Prophet, how you treat other mu'mineen, how you treat other human beings. This is why in, if you look at the Prophet's 23 years, his, his, his ministry, his prophetic mission, the, the Prophet, the, for, for in the beginning of the, especially in the Meccan period, the focus was on belief and ethics. Many of the Islamic rituals, for example, fasting was legislated in Medina. Prayer was legislated later on in, uh, in the, uh, the Meccan period, you know, in, uh, you know, during the Isra or Mi'raj. So there are so many of the, the religious practices, the religious the forms of worship came later on. So the Prophet began his mission by teaching people how to be civilized, how to be true human beings. He tried to cultivate humanity in people because many of the people in Arabia, they lost their sense of decency. They lost their sense of humanity. This is why even in Surah Al-Baqarah, which is a Madani Surah, Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala, for example, He, he says, وَقُولُوا لِلنَّاسِ husna." Speak good words to people. Speak pleasantly to people. وَأَقِيمُ الصَّلَاةَ وَآتُ الزَّكَاةَ So before Allah commands Muslims to uphold and establish prayer and pay charity and pay alms, Allah says to them, speak good words to people. Don't just speak kindly to believers. Speak kindly to everybody that interacts with you. وَقُولُوا Not لِلْمُسْلِمِينَ وَقُولُوا لِلنَّاسِ حُسْنَا So the last part of the, the surah, as I said, it speaks about the true nature of, of faith. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wants Muslims to understand that Islam is not just about praying five times a day and fasting. In fact, there's a very beautiful statement by Amir al Mu'mineen alayhi salam in Nahjul Balagha. And you know, if you look at the life of Ali ibn Abi Talib, what's, what's interesting, what's ironic is that the people who fought him tooth and nail, they were people who prayed. There are people who fasted. They were people who recited the Quran. So there are. This shows you that there are many people who pray and they fast, but they're not progressing. There are many people who pray and they fast, but in fact they are distant from God. They're not close to God. Amir al-Mu'minin alayhi salam. He says, "Kam min sa'imin," and you can almost hear the frustration. In the words of Ali ibn Abi Talib, he says, "Kam min sa'imin, laysa lahu min siyamihi illa al-ju'u wal-zama." Imam Ali salam he says, "And how many are those who fast, but they do not gain anything from their fasting except hunger and thirst?" And it's true. Some of us we fast the entire month of Ramadan. And we gain nothing. We don't change. We don't improve. We still mistreat our family members. We backbite. We betray people. We lie. We hurt other people. We don't have compassion. We're not forgiving. 
The only thing that we've gained is what? We just, all, all, we just deprived ourselves for one month. That's all that we did. And then the Imam says, وَكَمْ مِنْ قَائِمٍ لَيْسَ لَهُ مِنْ قِيَامِهِ إِلَّا, إلا السَّهْرُ وَالْعَنَى Imam Ali ibn Abi Talib, and he says, and how many are those who stand in worship? There are many people, they, they might do all of the nawafil. They might pray Salatul Layl religiously every night. They might stand and recite Dua, Abi Hamza Thumali, Dua Kumail, you name it. There are some people, they will do all of the a'mal that are mentioned in Mafatih al Jinnah. But the Imam says, there are some of among them, they gain nothing from standing in worship except fatigue and feeling tired. That's all that they gain. They just tire their bodies. Why? Because they haven't they haven't understood the spirit of of worship. That what's what's the point of of praying and fasting if it's not making you a more decent human being? That if you, if you are a person who's close to God should reflect the attributes of God. You know, when we say that Rasulullah is the closest one to God, what we mean by that is, of course, we're not talking about physical proximity. When we say Rasulullah is the closest person to God, what that means is that he is the most powerful he is, he is the most powerful reflection of God's attributes. That's why Allah says about him, you know, وَإِنَّكَ لَعَلَىٰ خُلُقٍ عَظِيمٍ وَمَا أَرْسَلْنَاكَ إِلَّا رَحْمَةً لِلْعَالِمِينَ It's because he's the most godly person. that you, you get a small taste of God's attributes when you interact with the Prophet. It's because he's close to God. And... So the, the, the last part of, of the surah is of this surah is significant because there are many people, especially in the ninth year after the hijrah, that when when they're coming into Islam and they're told about all of the do's and the don'ts and all of the the daily rituals, the fasting, the prayers. But sometimes, brothers and sisters, and we're also guilty of this, you know, sometimes. We let our ibadah, we, we perform our ibadah at the expense of others. I'll give you some examples. You know, sometimes we might build a masjid in a city. And the majority of the residents of that city or that neighborhood are non-Muslim. But what do we do? We build a masjid, and I, I've seen this, I've heard this with my own ears. I've seen this firsthand. A community decides to build a masjid. Wonderful. The masjid is surrounded by non-Muslim residents. What, what, does, what, 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 are, what do we decide to do? We decide to broadcast the adhan of Salatul Fajr. So we, we perform Salatul Fajr, which is, which is supposed to be an act of worship. But through this act of worship, we hurt other people. We disturb other people. Adhan is adhan wajib. Adhan is mustahab. We can do adhan in our mosques. We don't need to broadcast it and disturb our non-Muslim neighbors. If the Prophet ﷺ was among us, do you think that he would bother and disturb the neighbors like that? So this is an example of how sometimes we allow our worship to hurt others. We're not considerate of other people. You know, sometimes when you go to the masjid, someone is reciting, especially on the nights of Qadr. This happens all the time. Someone is reciting Quran out loud. Why don't you recite Quran quietly to yourself? You're, you're preventing all of these other people from doing their own a'mal. You know, sometimes when we when we go to the masjid, we want to sit in a particular spot in the masjid. We want to pray in a specific space. And we push people and we shove people. When we go to hajj, we do tawaf. And for those of you who have been to hajj, tawaf is an act of worship. But we're elbowing this person, we're pushing this person. When we go for ziyarah, people are 
yelling at the top of their lungs, totally inconsiderate of, of the ziyadahs that other people are reciting. Is this Islam? See, sometimes, you know, these are examples of when we allow our ibadah to inconvenience other people. And we shouldn't do that because this is, this is a sign that we have not understood the essence of worship. You shouldn't disturb people. You should be conscious of, you should be accommodating. So, with that said, this surah is really a surah that teaches us akhlaq. Akhlaq in dealing with the Prophet. Akhlaq in dealing with each other as community members. And it ends with a reminder of what, what Islam is all about. That it's all about God consciousness. That it's all about upholding the rights of God and upholding the rights of the people. Now, before we begin with the first verse, I just wanted to share a couple of hadith with you about akhlaq. There's a, and, and, and really this shows you how important it is for us to develop noble character. There's a hadith from the Holy Prophet where he says, إِنَّ الْعَبْدَ لَيَبْلُغُ بِحُسْنِ خُلْقِهِ عَظِيمَ دَرَجَاتِ الْآخِرَةِ وَشَرَفَ الْمَنَازِلِ وَإِنَّهُ لَضَعِيفُ الْعِبَادِ The hadith from the Prophet says that verily a servant will definitely reach high ranks and honorable stations in the hereafter through his good character, through his akhlaq, even if he is weak in his worship. You know, brothers and sisters, if I were to tell you that there's a person who doesn't do any mustahabbat, they don't do any recommended acts of worship. They don't ever recite Dua Kumail. They don't do Dua Abu Hamza Thumali. They don't recite any ziyaras. They just do their wajibat and nothing else. You may assume that this person, Allah may grant them Jannah, but they're probably going to be in the lower stations of paradise. This is what we would assume. That someone who does the bare minimum with respect to worship, is probably going to be among the people who occupy the lower stations of Jannah. But the Prophet, he says, if such a person has good akhlaq, even if they only do the bare minimum, they will occupy the highest stations in Jannah. So someone may only do the five daily prayers, never does salatul lay, doesn't do any recommended acts but because they're gentle because they're kind because they're thoughtful because they're they're courteous because they don't harbor any malice or hatred towards other people because they're so forgiving allah will elevate them he will elevate them and there's another hadith where the prophets he speaks about the day of judgment he says, مَا مِنْ شَيْءٍ أَثْقَلُ فِي الْمِيزَانِ مِنْ حُسْنِ الْخُلُقِ That there is nothing that is heavier on the scales than good character, than having good akhlaq. And one, one final narration, and then inshallah we'll begin with the, uh, the first verse. All of us want to be close to the Prophet. You know, if you ask any believer that, you know, in the, in the Akhir, who do you want to be close to? We want to be close to the Prophet. We want to be most beloved to him. The Prophet ﷺ, he says, Inna ahabbakum ilay wa aqrabakum minni yawm al qiyamati majlisan That the, the one who is going to be the closest to me on the Day of Judgment the one who is going to be the most beloved to me on the Day of Judgment is the one Ahsanukum Khuluqan. It's not the one who did the most prayers. It's not the one who recited the most Qur'an. Now, these are good deeds. But what has primacy 
over all of these things is to have good akhlaq. That the one who has good akhlaq will be the most beloved to the Prophet and they will be physically closest to the Prophet on that day. وَأَشَدُّكُمْ تَوَاضُعًا And the one who is the most humble. These are the people that will be the most beloved, that will be in the closest proximity to the Holy Prophet. So if we're doing extra prayers and we're doing all of these superfluous acts of worship, we have to make sure that we're also paying attention to our akhlaq. Because without akhlaq, these extra good deeds they're worthless. They don't have any value unless we're paying attention to how we treat others.